Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, IT department didn't let me quit and refused to pay my salary. I will make your company go bankrupt. I was employed by a tiny software business in a specialized industry just outside of Boston. I had been employed by the company for a few years when we all discovered that a New Jersey-based company had acquired us. If I agreed to work for the company for at least a year, the company pledged to pay for my relocation expenses. And this is going to be crucial later. I would be in charge of the entire infrastructure, including the HVAC system and power generation, and I would have a team of five sysadmins and two DBAs. Of course, I had to assess each system to make sure everything was in working condition as one of my first tasks. Technically, I discovered that things were only fair. There was obviously potential for improvement. However, software licensing was in total turmoil. They operated a Microsoft-only business and lacked any licenses for either their server operating systems or databases. In essence, they were pirating pirate-themed software. Now, it's one thing for little Joey to run a current version of Photoshop on his home computer, but it's quite another if a large, technically-oriented corporation runs only pirated software in their data center. So I immediately got in touch with the CTO, who was also a very recent employee, to inform him of what I had seen. We came to the conclusion that it was a major problem, and we presented a topic for discussion at the following management meeting, with an estimated cost of almost $100,000 to bring us into compliance. And that was just for the servers. The senior management of this company, who were very wealthy individuals, who gained their money in the construction industry, decided it would be a good idea to join the dot-com trend. They had zero prior knowledge of managing a sizable IT infrastructure or knowledge employees, but that may be a whole other tale. We explained the catastrophic status of our compliance and asked for money to become compliant. Naturally, the request was turned down. When you work in IT, you can't just do stuff like that because if it's discovered that you're pirating software in a commercial context, both the firm and you will be sued. So as a CIA, either the CTO or I would bring up the license inconsistencies at every management meeting, and we documented it on paper and via email. A few months later, the bad management choices are beginning to show. They are now seeking a takeover from another company as their pipe dream of going public is steadily disappearing. Payroll alone is causing the corporation to go through cash at an incredible rate. It turns out that I have to start firing employees, which is something I've never had to do. And let me tell you, it's a horrifying experience. Naturally, the decision makers don't want to engage in eye contact during the process. Thus, it fell to me. I quickly ran out of employees and had to take on all of the duties of maintaining the business by myself. I had made the decision that it was time for me to leave. But there was one catch. They were leveraging the fact that I still had a contract to keep me there for a few more months to force me to stay. They would have to pay me thousands of dollars in moving costs if I left. So, like any business-minded young man, I made the decision that trying to get fired was the best course of action. The CTO, with whom I was still very close, was informed of my intention and since he was also preparing for his departure, gave his approval inadvertently. I made the judgment that I deserved a larger office since I was now the entire IT department, so I took all of my belongings upstairs to the nice offices after everyone had departed for the day and selected the one with the most space. The nasty COO comes by the following morning while I'm working away in my beautiful new space and gives me the side eye. A few days later, the evil COO informs my employer that I must relocate because they want to combine office space 
with another business they own and they need my office for the construction company's accountant. I issue him with a threat. Tell him that if I take my stuff out of this office, it's going to my car. I type out a resignation letter to have on hand and get to work finding a new job right away. This continues for almost another two weeks. Once more, the evil COO orders my boss to leave his office, saying, No, really, he's got to move out of that office. My supervisor cautions him against taking this step, but he ignores that advice and continues. So I print up my letter and enter his office without knocking, place my resignation letter on his desk, and then leave after a CTO enters my office and notifies me of the evil COO's demand. He had the most priceless expression, and you would need a shovel to pry his jaw off the desk. The majority of my belongings were already packed, so I grabbed the box and just headed out the door. I called to ask about my last pay when payday rolls around, and according to the evil COO, they are withholding it to cover the costs associated with the move. I tell him it's against the law to do that. They are free to sue me for the cost. I call to ask about my last payday when payday rolls around. According to the evil COO, they are withholding it to cover the costs associated with the move. I tell him it's against the law to do that, and they are free to sue me for the costs, but they are required by law to pay my wages. Once more refusing, I withdraw ultimatum number two. Either you write me a check right away, or I'll call you back twice after we hang up, and you won't like what happens. Do what you have to do, he said. Don't claim I didn't warn you, all right? When I applied for Cobra, I also learned that, although they had been collecting money for my paychecks for health insurance, they had never really given me a policy, thus I had been paying for nothing those entire months. The New Jersey State Labor Board was contacted first to report the non-payment of wages. Call number two was sent to the Software Publishers Association, which at the time acted as the licensing dispute representative for a number of businesses, including Microsoft. I gave them the information on all of their systems, the extent of their license noncompliance, and promised to testify at any necessary dispositions or trials. I also informed my CTO friend that this was happening and advised him to prepare for the impending storm. We appeared before the arbitrator at the labor board hearing. The HR woman smugly handed me the signed contract for the moving charges, which I had already included in my filing, believing that it would be her magic wand. After they presented their case, I countered that they had violated the agreement because I was no longer a manager, despite being offered the job of manager of network services and having to fire my entire staff. The mediator concurred. She demanded that they immediately issue me a check for the unpaid earnings multiplied by three as a punishment, as well as for the full amount of healthcare premiums that had been withheld from my salary. Phase one finished. The SPA arrived with attorneys and accountants to do an audit of all of their systems, the CTO informed me. The documents we had produced to show where this was a problem, as well as their responses, were given to them by their CTO. They ultimately settled for $250,000 to avoid going to court over the piracy after a rigorous audit. The SPA paid me 10% of that sum as a bounty. And the icing on the cake was the settlement. The business only survived a few more months before it was purchased out for pennies by a rival, simply for the clientele. Never, ever mess up with the IT guys. They practically own you if you work for a corporation large enough to have an IT department. They have access to all of your data and passwords, and they can discover anything you try to hide or erase. It amazes me that the IT department uses pirated software. You did everything you could very competently, and it resulted in you getting a large amount of money, and soon the company was bought out for pennies. What kind of company was it that didn't even have software licenses? They asked for this outcome. If a man wants to leave, 
let him go. That's it. But no, they decided to refuse to pay his wages, knowing that he had something to fine them for. IT guys are the guys who always follow through, and most importantly, he acted in accordance with the law. He was just doing his civic duty, basically. The next story is, HOA hired professionals to cut my private property. Friends, I have a story for you about revenge on my stupid HOA. So let me give you some background. I live in a quiet suburb and I'm not part of any HOA. I despise petty HOA rules, so I've always opposed any HOA that only wants money. Once a local HOA went too far. There is a beautiful bonsai tree on my land in a precious vessel. I got it from the former owners of my house, and I took over as the caretaker of this tree with all the responsibility. I cherished this tree very much and was constantly looking for the best place for it. I also tried to make sure that this tree provided some benefit, so I sometimes set it up so that it provided shade on the small table that stands next to my swing. It's really cool because you could ride the swing, get a little sweaty, and go sit at the table that's over there in the shade. My kids loved that place. All of that came crashing down when I saw a bunch of guys that hired this HOA tinkering with my tree. A few days later, that tree was cut down, and along with my private property, that precious vessel was destroyed. I couldn't believe it. I ran to that HOA, and they said it was a necessary measure because my tree was bothering my neighbors because my kids were always playing there. I decided not to cry about it for a long time, but to take action. I was convinced that I had to teach them a lesson they would not forget. First, I documented everything. Photos of the damage, timestamps, testimonies from neighbors, and footage from my neighbors' video cameras who were able to capture everything. Then I contacted the competent authorities. Unfortunately, in the place where I live, this is just a formality that is required before the court. My next step was to contact a lawyer and tell my story in a local group on the social network of our city. It was in this last detail that became a nightmare for them, because they faced not only a lawsuit, but also a broad negative reaction from our entire city. The backlash led to the immediate dismissal of several senior members of the HOA. But that was not enough. I decided to take this case to the end. The HOA realized the seriousness of the situation and that they would not be able to win. So they did not even spend money on any expensive lawyers. In about a month, I completely won in court and we reached a settlement in my favor. First, the HOA was obliged to pay me in full compensation. Secondly, there was an unofficial requirement that they had to publicly apologize. The HOA paid a rather expensive price for their trespass on my land. The next story is, Neighbors' animals walked and took a dump on Granny's property. She prepared a pretty good revenge. A fairly big park with a river in it is located at the end of the street, which is quick, significant information to grasp the area. The street twists almost like a cul-de-sac at this end, except instead of a middle house, there is a path for bicycling and walking into the park. The major road is located at the opposite end of our street, which has about 15 total homes. Here's the story. As a result of all this, my grandparents relocated to our city to reside in the house my grandma grew up in. The region was once thought to be on the outskirts of town when she was a child. Today, it's all but inner city. The majority of the families that had owned these houses either sold them and relocated, or their children now reside there. In any case, most people on the block had known our family in some capacity for years, and most people try to be good neighbors. One of the four or five homes with new occupants quickly became a source of irritation for my grandmother. They lived across from us in the cul-de-sac. They simply started destroying the property, not because of their attitude or anything else of the sort, 
they would begin an effort to fix something, only to abandon it and or make it worse. The home was painted in two distinct hues, the carport's awning was severely sagging, and the yard was almost always overgrown and covered in weird trash. Additionally, they requested for bizarre things like running a power connection from our house across the street to power a generator being used in their backyard, which bothered their elderly neighbor, Mrs. Ruth, and made it difficult for them to enjoy their music at night. What? My grandmother was very upset since the house which used to belong to her best friend had always been one of the prettiest on the street. But as time went on, stuff began to spiral out of control. They quickly began moving large amounts of trash into the backyard. Again, not a big concern unless there are actual bathtubs and toilets on your property that can be seen from the street. Their house was just in front of our side porch, and it was such an eyesore. Then we saw that they had brought home a few pets, three dogs and two cats, which they immediately started letting out in the open to roam wherever they pleased. Unfortunately, my city has a significant stray animal problem, and because their pets weren't fixed, the block ended up with an absurd number of animals roaming around after about a year and a half. The strange thing was that instead of trying to donate them or whatever, the family maintained keeping so many of them. They regularly had six to seven dogs and eight or nine cats coming and going from their backyard, all of which were collared. And all of these animals have to poop somewhere, of course. There were only two houses in between us heading clockwise, with the bike lane to the park in between those houses. Because they were across from us on the curving street end, and both of those houses had rocks in their front yard rather than grass, on the other hand, our home had grade A lawn with dense, lush, and scattered with rose bushes. It made my grandma quite happy, which is funny. Grandma was becoming quite tired of cleaning animal waste, as you can guess where all of their animals and stray cats and dogs preferred to relieve themselves. The neighbor's pet problem hasn't really been addressed at this point, but everyone on the block with grass in their front yard has been complaining about the animals. When my grandmother finally opened her eyes, she discovered two of their dogs in our backyard, digging in her vegetable patch, and one of their cats was peeing on her windshield. They had dug under our fence during the night. We witnessed them immediately rush into the front door after she chased them off our property, and Grandma lit up. She approaches the front door and shouts, Excuse me! into it, and then waits for someone to open it. When the father emerges, they begin conversing. But after a while, it turns into yelling, during which some of the neighbors are also present. While I'm waiting to enjoy this early morning popcorn on the porch, I observe my grandmother detach and begin to make her way back to the house. He reportedly apologized for his animals being on her property, but became irate when she pressed him for plans to prevent it from happening again. When she asked if he could keep them inside when no one was home, he answered, no, they'd make a mess of my house, and claimed that she was getting upset over just a small amount of poop. He made an attempt to argue that it was unreasonable for her to expect him to keep track of his outdoor animals while he and the other adults living there were at work. Don't worry, says Grandma. She has a plan. She only needs to wait until the weather is appropriate. Two months later, in June or July, since we are in South Texas, there will be no clouds or rain, simply scorching heat of above 95 degrees until dusk. I agree to assist her out with some yard work when she asks one day, but she insists that we go shopping first. She begins explaining the idea to me as we roll into the store and grab four to five large cayenne pepper and ordinary pepper canisters. Dogs and cats won't poop in your yard if you sprinkle cayenne pepper there, because it irritates their noses. However, you can't just dump a ton of it because doing so could damage the animal's pads, and if it rains, it will be useless because it would be washed away. So she had been waiting until late summer to execute this plan. 
After sunset, we started to cover the front and backyards with the pepper mixture after donning masks and safety glasses. And when I told my grandma that I had seen two or three other neighbors on the block doing similarly, she said, Oh, I know. All 13 plus families on the block agreed to do this at roughly the same time after she had already spoken to everyone on the block about it. After two or three days, the number of stray animal turds in our yard had significantly decreased. I believe we found one or two at the edge of the driveway. While the majority of the animals have started urinating all over that D-bag neighbor's property, including the driveway and the sidewalk in front of the house. We had a front row ticket to observe them repeatedly have to tiptoe past heaps of excrement despite the overwhelming odor. Watching them clean up all the trash before work just to get home, pull into the driveway and walk right into a nice wet lump of crap. And we do this for approximately two and a half weeks, replenishing the pepper mix every four to five days on the lawn. They would frequently glance at us from across the street, but they never said anything. The whole neighborhood is just giggling behind everyone else's back. Grandma eventually phoned the Department of Parks and Recreation and left an anonymous tip alleging that the large number of stray animals and uncleanliness levels of feces near the gate made it unsafe for her to enter the park. When they drove by and noticed the house, they quickly called animal control and a city inspector. The property appeared to be on the verge of being condemned and smelled strongly of it. You're only allowed to have eight pets on your land here, and these people had way more than double that, it turns out. They had to pay a hefty fine, lost all of the animals who were adopted out to no-kill shelters, and were caught breaking several building permit laws. They eventually relocated, a new family purchased the home, and they are now in every manner excellent neighbors. Grandma is once again incredibly proud of her lush grass. I don't really understand what prevented these people from making a place for the animals to go on their own territory instead of letting them walk wherever they go, causing inconvenience to the neighbors and everyone around. Although I respect the neighbor who at least feeds these animals and shelters them. That was in itself a good deed. But if you already take responsibility for these animals, then go all the way because there would be people who would harm these animals because they were annoyed by the destruction of their property rightfully so and it's good that they're okay and have been taken to a shelter where they will be cared for and are not going to be such a nuisance to everyone around don't mess with the grannies they've seen it all and they know how to run a business thanks for watching just a reminder subscribe like and comment see you soon